Welcome everyone. Um, my name is John Garbutt and I'm here with my colleagues Pierre and Steve from Stack HPC. And today we're going to talk to you about the coral reef crowd. Now this is a resource management concept. Um, we're going to look at reservations and preemptibles and quotas and how all these things uh, work together. So first I'm going to start talking about how HPC is typically deployed today. Um, or certainly traditionally been deployed. And here we have silos of infrastructure dedicated to a particular platform. So for example, if you wanted to do some big data work um, that was trying to do, uh, you know, some, some work that's trying to use technologies from big data and things like GPUs that might be in AI deep learning, but you want to structure it in kind of a HPC MPI kind of workload, um, it's difficult to know exactly which platform to go and use right now. The, the hardware is siloed, um, so you're sort of forced into adopting a platform that's got hold of the resources. So this is where we start talking about HPC 2.0, um, where we start talking about converged cloud. So what's happening in the background here is that lots of the hardware used for all of these different kinds of HPC workload are now converging. There's very similar hardware for uh, if you want to access GPUs for whatever type of workload. It's still the same kind of GPU and a similar kind of interconnect. So we can make use of this and actually pull all the hardware in one pool. And by using OpenStack as a cloud API on top of that, we have a single unified API to access any kind of resource. So as the needs change between um, different silos of what well, is different sort of platforms that create their own kind of silo, we can move the hardware between who's got the, the most need at this point in time and sort of load balance between all of those different requirements. Now, just to be clear about this not being make-believe, um, we've been quite heavily involved in a project um, called IRIS, which is a common STFC infrastructure, um, a common infrastructure for STFC science in the UK. Um, this is an OpenStack cloud, and it's part of a, a federation of various different services, including various different OpenStack clouds all working together. Um, this particular instance that we've been working on is um, operated by Cambridge University, for by their HPCS team. And it builds on work that we've done with them on the Alaska Performance Prototype System that you may have heard us talk about in the past. We use OpenStack KOB um, using Colo Ansible to deploy the system, and we've been working to ensure that we've got reference workloads so that scientists can make use of the cloud and get the work done that they need to get done. And this has all been funded through the, uh, the medium of digital assets as part of the, um, IRIS, S the IRIS bidding process. Um, so we must thank SDFC and IRIS for funding this work so we can make progress on um, building this HVC 2.0 converged cloud concept. The particular part of the problem that we want to talk to you about today is how do we get a good fair share of resources within this fixed capacity cloud? Um, now, this isn't specific to HPC as such, but it's, a, it's um, a specific need within the HPC, typical HPC funding cycles, is you have this fixed amount of capacity and you want to get the most um, research, and the most science done with that um, particular investment. So within the HPC world, it's very typical to use a batch scheduler. And lots of the concepts we're going to talk to you today are well implemented by batch schedulers. So they're very good at trying to get this fair share of resources. Um, so you, the concept of um, uh, carving up the system within the HPC batch schedulers, this idea of CPU hours per quarter very frequently. So you can review per quarter or per whatever time period you choose, like who gets um, who gets picked off the queue first. And if there's no one um, with a higher priority than you that with work on the queue, um, other people's work gets done. So you're, trying, you're basically you're getting a very high utilization from this finite capacity cluster. They do this um, and the, the sort of the system is, can be um, everything's on a queue, but you can actually sort of start to uh, jump the queue if you use things like reservations and 
um, and preemptions and the backfilling concepts. One of the limitations of this system is that in order for this system to work, you actually have to kind of package your your work into jobs, into these um, uh, units of work that go on the queue. Um, this is particularly hard for th things that you want to be interactive with, for example, if you want to have a Jupyter Hub service. Um, some, you know, some systems will let you do a two or three day job, but that's not really what you, the system that you want to use to um, have a sort of interactive long running process. Um, so it doesn't really work for that kind of interactive use case. So when we go back to the HPC 2.0 uh, converged cloud concept, OpenStack has quotas uh, to try and manage this fair share of resources. But quotas don't work very well when you've got a fixed capacity cloud, when you can't just sort of say, you can't just predict demand and say, well, um, now we're seeing rising demand, let's buy several more racks of um, gear and then put that into the cloud. And that doesn't always work, particularly when it's a, a grant based system and you've got this fixed size system that you want to get the most out of. So let's just review what kind of quotas in OpenStack do today. I like to call it pizza slicing um, to give fair share. So the idea is that you can have a look at your cloud and you say, well, we can divide it between these three people in these diff these three proportions. And then uh, what, what OpenStack does is it tries to make sure that you can't start at any one time any more than your, your quota allows for. This can cause lots of underutilization. So as you, as you saw in the previous slide, not necessarily everyone's using all of their quota all of the time. One fix for this problem is to start overlapping quotas. So in the knowledge that not everyone will use quite all of their quota, you hand out more quota on your cloud than you actually have resource for. This is quite a common practice. Now, the issue here is it tends to cause um, bad behavior, particularly when you start to run out of resource. People soon realize that the first person to spin up a VM gets hold of that VM and no one's going to shut them down. So people start doing land grabbing of creating very large VMs to make sure that they've got that VM for when they need it next week. And you start to get very bad behavior where your system looks utilized, but actually the VMs are there doing nothing because people are trying to sort of reserve their little spot and they do sort of empire building to try and create VMs and get more space. Um, so we kind of need to look at a way that we can have a model that doesn't doesn't work like that and that we can give people the structures to get the resources that they need. The other issue here is that when you start looking at quota management within lots of different groups or wanting different bits of um, capacity, um, managing quotas at scale, scale gets really hard. So you need some kind of level of hierarchy within the system. You kind of want to say that, you know, we're roughly dividing between um, this smaller set of units and within that people can share within you know multiple projects underneath that so we need some kind of level of hierarchy to really deal with this um, this slide is taken from a previous joint presentation with CERN when they were describing um, describing their their approach to this problem so another question another way of phrasing this problem is you know, if you know that tomorrow you need to get hold of 10 GPUs, how can you do that? How can you have that conversation with the um, resource provider on how to get hold of those GPUs? So to have a look at that question, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Pierre. So um, the answer to this question is to add a, a temporal concept to the quotas. And this can be done with uh, Blazar reservations. So uh, Blazar is a software part of OpenStack, uh, which provides uh, resource reservation as a service. And um, effectively, the, the users themselves can reserve instances for a specific period of time. They can also reserve uh, full hypervisors and deploy multiple instances uh, on, on this resource. And uh, what this provides is a, a guarantee that your resource is going to be available 
when you need it in the future. And so it, um, it helps uh, to avoid those issues that John was mentioning with quotas where people pre-allocate uh, when they actually don't need the resources now, but they need it later. Um, one caveat uh, of Blazar is that it uh, requires to enroll the Nova Compute nodes uh, into an exclusive use uh, for reservations. And that means that if your user are not actively allocating all the resources through reservations or within their reservations are not actually launching enough uh, instances to, um, uh, to fully use them, then you can end up with underutilization. And so that's where we hope that uh, auto-scaling can help. So what we mean by auto-scaling is platforms that can automatically add or remove capacity to themselves as required. So for that, we need to have uh, some sort of software-defined version of the platform, because we can't be manually configuring this ourselves. We need a way to change the, uh, the size of that platform and some sort of metric that captures demand. And all of this is going to be very platform-dependent. And there's a number of platforms that have already got uh, at least some level of support for this. So for example, uh, both vCycle and VM Dirac can spin up VMs on demand for grid PP jobs and can do things like retry jobs if VMs are deleted or back off creating VMs if there's insufficient quota or capacity. Kubernetes has got lots of features to support dynamic operations uh, and the cluster autoscalers, autoscaler is particularly interesting here. Uh, when containers go into a pending state because there's no room left on the cluster, it can call back into OpenStack Magnum to add capacity to the cluster, which allows those pending containers to start up. Now, John mentioned interactive use earlier, and this is particularly helpful for things like Jupyter Hub that spin up a new container when a user logs into the cluster. We've also been able to integrate Slurm with OpenStack in a similar way, essentially using the power management features that have been in Slurm for a while. And we're just going to explain over the next few slides how that works. So, we deploy a Slurm cluster with a control node, which could be a VM running the Slurm control daemon, and some persistent nodes. We call them persistent nodes. They're just normal Slurm nodes. They're always going to exist, and they provide a kind of a base level of service, I guess, to the cluster. We also have uh, cloud state nodes. Now, they aren't actually provisioned at this point. They're just defined in the Slurm config, and uh, and in, that's done in such a way that Slurm understands that it, it can't contact them initially. The other key part is that we upload an image to the cloud, represented by the, the disk icon here, which defines a compute node in a fully configured state so that as soon as it boots it, it can join the cluster. Uh, and there's some details about uh, how to make that work, about things like um, having a Slurm config offboard somewhere and things like that that we won't go into here because they're, they're not kind of the crucial point. So now when the scheduler decides it needs more nodes are needed to service the queue, it runs what it basically thinks is a power up script. Uh, but what it actually does is it talks to the cloud to launch some instances with the appropriate image. Once they boot, they contact the Slurm control node, which then starts the scheduled job on them as, as normal. And it's a very similar process to release nodes back to the cloud when the scheduler decides they aren't required looking, looking at the queue. Um, there's kind of a key thing here, which is to, to ensure that we have a single source of truth, both for this original cluster deployment and for the kind of auto-scaled nodes. Um, otherwise, you can get yourself into a real mess if, if uh, you're kind of getting a mismatch between the two. So you probably need some kind of image build pipeline or something like that uh, to ensure you've, you've got a kind of a reproducible cluster effectively. But what this does is it gets us from this situation where the platform, for example, Slurm, is hogging all of the resources in its crater all of the time to this, where we can hand nodes back to the cloud, but we still have a guaranteed quota or reservation that the platform can use. The problem is, is that that's not actually useful until we can put some workloads on these nodes we've handed back to the cloud. But that gets us back to the same problem of how do we do that and still guarantee that we can get these nodes back or that when the resources back when we need to. So this is where preemptibles can help. Preemptibles are instances that can be terminated at any time by the cloud infrastructure. It's also called spot instances in Amazon terminology, 
and has been adopted by other commercial uh, cloud vendors. It can be used by uh, workloads such as GridPP, which um, uh, supports uh, being terminated at any time. This is a concept that uh, has been uh, introduced to OpenStack by CERN. However, it was based uh, on changes to uh, Nova, including API changes that did not merge um, with the uh, uh, upstream community. So we are uh, investigating an alternative approach, which is purely implemented within OpenStack Bazaar. And uh, using this approach, we can fill the gap between Brazil reservations. So let's imagine that we have um, a few reservations on the cloud. Here we've got a, a graph with the time on the x-axis and the various resources on the cloud on the y-axis. Uh, and a few reservations here, we have a uh, four. You can see that there are gaps between those reservations, which uh, means there is underutilization. The idea is that we will schedule preemptible instances within those gaps, but Lazar will be able to terminate those uh, instances just before the reservations are ready to start. And this is a concept that will help us build uh, the entire coral reef. So by combining auto scaling with preemptibles, uh, we can have a system where a reservation for each platform is going to bound the maximum use of the platform and ensure that it has the availability of the resources that are required for the workload. But combining that with a new API to tell Blaza how much each platform is actually using at any point in time, uh, we can add the auto scaling element. And with this um, uh, API, uh, Blaza will be able to schedule preemptible workloads within the reservations as well, not just in the gaps between them. And of course, the platforms will be able to scale up and down when they need, and that will trigger the removal of the preemptible instances. So with this in place, we can combine all our elements, the quotas, the preemptibles, the auto-scaling and the reservation, and build our core reef. So now, how can we make this happen? So for Blazar specifically, there are a few steps that we are planning to take. First, we would like to improve the ease of use so that um, the, the user of the system don't necessarily have to create reservations, but they could be automatically uh, created uh, by the, some um, uh, quota management system. There's, of course, the work on integrating preemptibles, which is already uh, being developed upstream. And this concept of flexible reservation, uh, which um, allows Blazar to know at any time how much resources are actually being used within each reservation. How can you help us to build this? There are two places where you can get involved. First is within the Blazar project itself. We have meetings um, in two different uh, time zones. So the first one is uh, for Asia Pacific and um, Europe at 9 a.m. UTC on Tuesdays every week. And we also have uh, another meeting that is uh, more friendly for people based in Americas. And that's on Thursdays at um, uh, 4 p.m. UTC. That's only every two weeks. You can also get involved in the scientific SIG. There's a, a meeting every week at different times. Um, one that is more friendly for people based in Europe and another one which is more uh, for people based in Americas. And finally, if you want to um, uh, keep hearing about the progress of this project, you can follow us on Twitter. We are at StackHPC. And you can, of course, contact us directly by email. And those are the addresses to uh, reach out to us. Thank you for listening. <laughs>